Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar in our 2024 Summer Webinar and Open House series, The Oxalate Paradox. For those of you who already know us, feel free to skip to just before the 11 minute point in this video when Dr. Karen begins the actual presentation. For those of you who don't know us yet, I'm Dr. Rick Dina and you'll be hearing from Dr. Karen Dina in a few minutes. We're both chiropractic physicians who have been on the whole food, plant-based path, heavily focused on raw fruits and vegetables for over 35 years each, essentially all of our adult lives, and are board certified and licensed in the state of California. We have hosted summits for the past nine years. Here is the banner for the first eight years. And here is also the uh, Raw Food Nutrition Handbook that we're the authors of. And here is our banner for the most recent year, 2024. In each of these summits, we interview different plant-based doctors and raw food and plant-based educators to share inspiring, informative, and useful information about implementing plant-based diets. There are a variety of different approaches out there and it's good to know that there is a little bit of flexibility for individuals within those different approaches. Our approach can be summed up by whole food, all plant, based on fruits and vegetables. We are the course developers and instructors originally for our Science of Raw Food Nutrition series of classes, and more recently for our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition 12-month online curriculum that you can learn more at the end of this webinar if you want to stick around and do so. Please note, however, before we continue, that the information and opinions expressed by us in this webinar are not intended to be used as medical advice and should not be used to diagnose or treat any medical condition or as a substitute for individual health care. This webinar is presented with the understanding that we're not liable for misconception, misuse, or adverse effects resulting from its use. Any type of dietary change, nutritional therapy, or fasting should always be undertaken with the supervision of a qualified healthcare provider, and watching this webinar does not establish a doctor-patient relationship. Each of our webinars tend to follow the same pattern, We've got the introduction, which is pretty much covered now, and now we've got a little of Dr. Karen's background and my background, so you know a little bit more about who you're hearing from in this presentation. I'll let Dr. Karen take it away with her background. I found raw food at a time when I was experiencing notable fatigue, for which there was apparently no answer. I was in college at the time and I was sleeping 10, 12, and sometimes even more hours per night and still waking up non-refreshed. I saw three medical professionals, and after multiple lab tests and evaluations, I had a diagnosis, fatigue of unknown origin. They had a whole list of everything that I didn't have, but could not pinpoint the source of my fatigue. I asked every single one of them if my fatigue may have had anything to do with my college diet and lifestyle. They all emphatically said no. Things really started to change, however, when a friend gave me a copy of a book that discussed vegan diets and the connection between diet and health. I also learned about the connections between diet and the environment and the way animals are treated. And with all these compelling arguments, I was open to giving this approach a try and I became vegan. In addition to feeling good about eating compassionately and leaving a lighter footprint on the earth, I was so excited to find that my fatigue actually started to improve, despite what the so-called experts, in this case the medical professionals, said would happen. This personal experience opened the door to my thinking that diet really could make a difference in health and left me open to exploring other opportunities. When I learned about and implemented a raw food diet, my energy soared far beyond the impressive improvements that I experienced by eating vegan. Long story short, my fatigue vanished, along with a variety of other symptoms that I'd had for years, and I had more energy than I knew what to do with. I could not remember a time when I felt better. I started to look healthier, and I slept better. 
I enjoyed exercising and my digestion improved. I was so inspired by the health results I was experiencing that I felt compelled to learn more about the inner workings of the human body, nutrition, and the diet health connection. I really wanted to immerse myself in learning as much as I could. So I earned a second undergraduate degree in biology and then received doctorate level education in naturopathic medicine and chiropractic, which helped me to put everything that I observed into perspective and on a much deeper level. Over the years, I've refined and revised my approach to raw food and tailored it to my individual needs. And we can show you how to do this too. Next, Dr. Rick will share with you a bit about his background and experience with raw food and plant-based nutrition. So take it away, Dr. Rick. Here are a couple of photos of me before and after from my late teens. They're about a year and a few months apart. In the process of going from the first photo to the second one, as you can imagine, I felt an awful lot better. That very much inspired me to keep learning as much as I could. Now, in the past year's webinars, I have given some more details about my background. I've included things like athletic endeavors, race times, etc. So if you go back and watch some of those webinars, you can see more details. Also, for those of you who saw our 2023 Raw Food and Plant-Based Mastery Summit, Dr. Karen and I each did a self-interview where we shared quite a bit more about our background. So if you saw that or if you have purchased the summit and have lifetime access, you can see more details. Uh, for this webinar, though, we're just going to cover the basics and keep things succinct to keep things moving. A few years after each of those photos that you saw, I graduated from the University of Connecticut with a degree in business administration. After graduating, I got a job as a chiropractic assistant and saw some really excellent things happen with patient recovery during that time. After a year of that, I had the opportunity to work at a raw vegan health institute in West Palm Beach, Florida. Some of you have been around the movement for a while. Remember the juice man, a guy named Jay Cordich who would come on infomercials and, and talk about juices. Uh, so for a while back in the early 90s, I was part of the support team that would travel around the country and put on seminars and sell juicers and talk to people about the benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables uh, and their juices. So that was pretty fun. At that point, it was extremely clear to me that I was really into health and wanted to make a, a lifetime career out of that. So I went back to school to earn a doctorate degree in chiropractic. And I've got to say, so many things that I knew about already about health got so much more clear and I understood in so much more depth and understood how it all fit together so much more by learning all of the sciences, earning my doctorate degree uh, to a level that just would not have been possible without some type of advanced degree like that. That also afforded me the opportunity to go to True North Health, where I did a six-month internship and then ended up staying for four years. Those of you who don't know, True North Health is a medically supervised water-only fasting center. I got to witness or be involved in the supervision of the care of six to 800 fasting patients during that time. And I saw some absolutely remarkable things. Uh, a lot, lot I could say about that, but it, it was truly remarkable and uh, got to just a wealth of clinical experience from that. I was actually stolen away from True North by my long distance girlfriend at the time, uh, whose name is, was Dr. Karen. She was becoming Dr. Karen. She actually um, was going to Bastyr University, as you hear, heard her say in the naturopathic medical program. So I moved up there with her and I actually developed a curriculum that I taught to the naturopathic medical students. As I mentioned at the beginning, we developed the science of raw food nutrition curriculum uh, over the course of several years. I mean, it's thousands of hours worth of effort to put that course uh, together. 
and uh, and it laid the foundation. Now, sorry, we taught that in person for about 10 years, and that laid the foundation for the new and improved Mastering Raw Food Nutrition curriculum that we are going into our ninth year of teaching now. For several of these years, in addition to a lot of clinical experience from True North, I worked with patients who were vegans and raw vegans or those who would like to be guiding them nutritionally, looking at their lab work, etc. And I, I learned an awful lot there as well. Things you, you can't learn from reading in books and those types of things. One of the nice things I like about that is a lot of my clinical experience working with patients was incorporated and still is incorporated into our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition curriculum. And a lot of the things we teach our students very much come in handy with our patients also. So the two of those very much work synergistically. Now that we've covered the introduction and you know a little bit more about who you'll be hearing from, let's move on to the educational topic for this webinar. The topic for this webinar is lesser known information about oxalate and oxalic acid. And the reason why we're having this webinar is because we want to share with you information that might not necessarily be known out there in the health community. We think that the information that's out there is um, maybe not as well-rounded as we'd like to see. So we wanted to add to the conversation so you can have a more well-rounded view of this really fascinating topic. So to get started, um, oxalate, also popularly known as oxalic acid, is a substance that's found in some foods that can bind to certain minerals such as iron, calcium, and zinc, and other ones as well. Um, oxalate binds to these minerals, making them less bioavailable or less useful to our body. Oxalate is found in a number of foods, but certain foods are very high in oxalate, uh, making them not good sources of iron, calcium, or zinc. And those examples would include spinach, Swiss chard, Swiss chard, beet greens, and parsley. Now, it's important to note that these are not bad foods. Uh, they're just not good sources of certain minerals, especially when they're raw. It's important to know that oxalate will not steal iron or calcium from your body, so that's at least good to know. Here's a table showing the oxalic acid content of some of the foods that we just mentioned and some other ones as well. And as you can see, Parsley, chives, purslane, spinach, and beet greens are much higher in oxalic acid than the foods that are further down on the table. Now, it's difficult to avoid oxalic acid altogether, but if we focus our diet on lower oxalate foods, uh, less of our dietary minerals will be bound to oxalate and will therefore be more available for use by our body for important processes, such as the formation of red blood cells and assisting with carrying oxygen from our lungs to our tissues. Now, since oxalic acid is discussed mostly in the context of food sources, as we just talked about, in general, most people think that oxalic acid in our body originates exclusively from plants. But is this actually true? As it turns out, about 40% of the oxalate in our body is derived from our diet. So where does the other 60% come from? The answer is, it's produced by our body. Now this may come as a surprise because many influencers in the health world talk about the importance of eliminating plant foods to avoid oxalic acid. So let's take a closer look at this. In order to get a better idea of how oxalic acid is produced by our body, it's helpful to look at some biochemical pathways that show this. So what I'm showing you here is a simplified version of the biochemical pathways that can lead to the production of oxalic acid in our body. Like I said, this is a simplified version. There's actually um, a lot more complexity to this, but I just wanted to make it as easy as possible for us to examine this. Now, what it comes down to is that oxalic acid is produced from normal metabolic processes in our body. This is something that we really can't avoid. It just happens normally. 
So to get started, when certain amino acids derive from proteins in our diet or particular amino acids that are produced by our body are converted into the amino acid serine, here's serine right here from normal amino acid metabolism, um, serine can then be converted into the amino acid glycine, as we can see right here, which then can lead to the formation of glyoxalate and then oxalic acid. So like I said, this is a normal metabolic process. Serine is converted into these intermediates that then can be converted into oxalic acid. So that's how that part of the pathway works. Now, let's look at another part of the pathway. Another one has to do with collagen. And collagen is a really popular topic in the health community these days. Now, in our body, we have connective tissue that is important for providing structure and support to other tissues like muscles and organs, for example. Now, collagen is an important part of connective tissue. Now, this collagen from time to time needs to be replaced. And when it's broken down during this turnover or breakdown process, a substance called hydroxyproline is created. So here's hydroxyproline from collagen. And hydroxyproline is then converted into glyoxalate, which then can be converted into oxalic acid. So that's just another way that oxalic acid can be formed in our body. And then the next part of this pathway that we're gonna talk about has to do with free radical production. Now, free radicals are reactive molecules produced within our body from normal metabolic processes and also through chemicals that come into our body in food, water, and air that we breathe in. So during free radical production, this substance called glyoxyl is produced. And then glyoxyl is converted into glyoxylate and then eventually oxalic acid. So as we can see right here um, from this metabolic pathway or series of metabolic pathways, uh, there are three ways that we've examined here where oxalic acid can be formed. And like I said, once again, these are normal metabolic processes. But the production of oxalic acid here really can't be avoided since, like I said, these are normal metabolic processes. Even people who consume minimal or no plant foods will have the formation of oxalic acid. Now, as I've said a few times, uh, these are all normal processes, but there are some situations that can lead to greater oxalic acid production in our body. So let's take a look at those next. Number one is inborn errors of metabolism, specifically things that are genetic in nature. With the pathways that we just talked about, uh, there are genetic mutations that can lead to excessive production of oxalic acid. Um, I'm not gonna go into that here because that's a little bit more complicated and I really like to focus on the things that we can actually have some control over. Um, so let's take a look at the things that um, we can be mindful of. The first thing would be certain nutrient insufficiencies or deficiencies. Uh, a good example would be pyridoxin or vitamin B6. So if we look at our pathway here, we can see that vitamin B6 is involved in the conversion of glyoxalate into glycine. Now, glycine can take a couple of different pathways. Okay, as we mentioned earlier, it can uh, be converted back into glyoxalate, turn into oxalic acid, um, but it can also be used for DNA synthesis and the creation of red blood cells. Um, in a situation where vitamin B6 is limiting, then what can happen is that they can slow down the conversion of glyoxalate into glycine. And therefore, what's gonna happen is that hydroxyproline and glyoxyl, when they turn into glyoxalate, they're gonna be shunted into oxalic acid production instead of going back up into glycine and then going into DNA synthesis. So that part of the pathway is gonna be blocked. Yeah, so really hydroxyproline and glyoxyl really have no choice. When they turn into glyoxalate, then they get shunted into oxalic acid, increasing 
oxalic acid production. So let's take a look at some really good food sources of vitamin B6. And fortunately, if you're eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, you can get a really good amount of vitamin B6. So on our table right here, we have some really excellent sources. For example, sunflower seeds, uh, lentils, romaine lettuce when eaten in quantity. For example, in the amounts that people on a, uh, a raw food type of diet would eat like one head, uh, that's not unusual for a raw food is to eat one head of romaine lettuce in a day. That'll give you 0.5 milligrams of pyridoxin, aka vitamin B6. And if we take a look at the adult DRIs for pyridoxin right down here, we see that for women um, up to the age of 50, it's 1.3 milligrams. And then over the age of 50, it's 1.5 milligrams. And then for men, up until the age of 50, it's 1.3 milligrams. And then over the age of 50 is 1.7. So as you can see, a lot of these sources are really excellent for vitamin B6. Yeah, even one medium avocado will give you 0.4 milligrams of B6. That's great. One medium banana has 0.4. That is pretty amazing. If you really like dandelion greens like I do, uh, 0.4 milligrams from three cups. Uh, that's not unusual for me to put into my salad. If you consume uh, fewer dandelion greens, you can always adjust this number accordingly. Uh, one thing I'd like to say with lentils, you can either cook those or raw foodists like to um, soak them and then sprout them. And uh, what I found is one half cup dry sprouts up into about um, two cups or thereabouts, depending on how long I let it sprout. Uh, red bell pepper, one cup, uh, 0.4 milligrams. That's really good. And then for people who like potatoes, uh, baked potato can give you 0.4 as well. And then I have some other things here too uh, for raw foodists and for people eating plant-based diets. So there's a variety of things that you can really choose from uh, when it comes to good sources of pyridoxin. And then the things lower down here are not as good sources, but I wanted to show you these because what it comes down to is that if you're eating a variety of plant foods, you can do very well with vitamin B6. Next, I wanted to talk about glutathione because glutathione is oftentimes talked about as being found exclusively in animal foods. That's just not true. And we'll talk about why in just a couple minutes. Now, glutathione is an antioxidant that's made by our body. You can also find it, like I said, in certain foods, as we'll talk about in a moment. It's an antioxidant that's involved in neutralizing certain free radicals. Coming back to our biochemical pathway here, let's take a look down here at free radical production. During the production of free radicals, we have the production of glyoxyl, which instead of going into glyoxylate and oxalic acid, if it's converted, using glutathione, it can be converted into glycolic acid, which then can be excreted by our body. So it's important to keep this pathway going and having a good amount of glutathione can be quite helpful. But if glutathione is limiting, as we can see here, then what's gonna happen is that glyoxyl, instead of going into glycolic acid and then being excreted from the body, will go into glyoxylate and then into oxalic acid. Now, it's possible that it can go into glycine and then DNA synthesis, but that doesn't happen that much. And the reason why is because there's plenty of other metabolic processes that produce glycine that go into DNA synthesis after that. So since our body has really a constant supply of glycine to be able to do that, this particular pathway isn't utilized all that much. So most of that glyoxylate is going to go into oxalic acid in a situation of limited glutathione. Now, what are some food sources of glutathione? Now, I mentioned earlier that for whatever reason, it seems like people are talking about glutathione as being found mostly in animal foods. But like I said, their body can make it. And there are some excellent sources of it from plant foods. And this was just the result of one study that I found. There's a lot of other ones that talk about this and have similar numbers. 
Um, what I found here is that asparagus and avocado are incredible sources of glutathione. Now in this particular study, they looked at a couple of different forms of glutathione, so I actually included both of them here. Now these two forms are used by our body in different situations, but I thought it was important to, to show you both so that you could see the forms of glutathione that are found in these foods. So, like I said, asparagus and avocado are excellent sources of glutathione. Excellent. And then secondarily, things like walnuts are very good as well. Broccoli and cauliflower are also excellent, as well as tomatoes, and then lemons, carrots, and peaches, nectarines, orange, strawberries. Those are very good sources as well. So as you can see, there's a variety of foods that actually provide both forms of glutathione in notable amounts. And then the next thing that I wanted to talk about is that selenium is a mineral that helps glutathione do its job better. So what's a really good source? Uh, Brazil nuts. As it turns out, one average size Brazil nut has almost 91 micrograms of selenium in it. And if we compare that to the daily value of 55 micrograms, that is significant. Uh, one Brazil nut, average size Brazil nut, contains about 165% of the adult daily value for selenium. So as far as Brazil nuts go, I consume hmm, three or four Brazil nuts a week. Now, so far, we've talked about some things that can increase oxalic acid production in our body. We've talked about genetics, we've talked about certain nutrient insufficiencies or deficiencies. And then I wanna talk about supplements. Certain supplements can actually increase the amount of oxalic acid produced by our body. And I really haven't seen much about this out there in the health community. I'm wondering if it's just not known, but I wanted to let you know this so that you can make some informed decisions for yourself. And the first one has to do with collagen supplementation. Collagen supplements, are very popular. So if one is consuming collagen supplements, then if that collagen from that particular supplement isn't used to create more collagen in our body, then what our body is going to do is it's going to break down that collagen into hydroxyproline. Yep, hydroxyproline, which then gets converted into glyoxalate and then mostly gets shunted into oxalic acid. Some of it might be converted into glycine and then go into DNA and red blood cell creation. But like I said earlier, plenty of glycine is formed from other metabolic processes in the body that you know come down through serine and such. So if there isn't really a need for, for DNA or red blood cells at the time, then a lot of that hydroxyproline converted to glyoxalate is gonna end up as oxalic acid. So what it comes down to is that if you're taking a collagen supplement that your body isn't going to use to create more collagen because it already has other things that are making collagen in your body, then there's a very good chance that a lot of that collagen is gonna eventually end up as oxalic acid. And then the next one is creatine, because that's another really popular supplement. So if we come back over here to our pathway, as it turns out, creatine is created from glycine and from arginine, uh, two amino acids. And so once again, kind of similar to what we were talking about with collagen, is that if our body doesn't need creatine, if, if it's already making enough or it just doesn't have a use for creatine from the supplement, then what's going to happen is it's going to get broken down into its constituents, one of which is glycine. And if there's already plenty of glycine from other metabolic processes, then it's likely not going to be needed to make DNA or red blood cells. So a lot of it's going to get funneled down here into glyoxalate and eventually end up as oxalic acid. Up until this point, we've talked about how certain situations in the body can lead to more oxalic acid. Now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and actually 
take a look at how the microbiome can influence oxalic acid in our body. And first off, I'd like to look at oxalobacter formigenes. Now, oxalobacter formigenes is a probiotic that lives in our microbiome that actually consumes dietary oxalate before it even enters the body. So in our microbiome, oxalobacter formigenes and a few other types of probiotics can consume oxalate. Yep. And what's been found in studies is that the greater the concentration of oxalobacter formigenes in our microbiome, the lower the amount of oxalate available to be absorbed. It makes sense because oxalobacter formigenes consumes dietary oxalate in our microbiome. And what's also been found is that the absence of oxalobacter formigenes from our microbiome is associated with increased oxalate stone formation, specifically kidney stones. So having some oxalate in our diet from plant foods can actually encourage the growth of oxalobacter formigenes and can help to increase microbiome diversity. And because oxalobacter formigenes consumes oxalate, that can also help decrease the amount of oxalate that is absorbed into our body. And then the last thing I'd like to talk about is that calcium in moderate amounts, what I saw in the scientific literature is somewhere around 1,000 milligrams to 1,200 milligrams, which is actually uh, the daily value, has been shown to inhibit the absorption of oxalate at the intestinal lining. That's fascinating. So having some oxalate in our diet and having moderate or appropriate amounts of calcium can really help to make a difference. So in summary, oxalic acid is made by our body, about 60% of it, whereas about 40% is obtained from our diet. Now, how does the body produce more oxalic acid? First of all, genetics. And a small percentage of the population has genetic mutations that lead to the formation of more oxalic acid. There really isn't all that much that we can do about that. But what we can do is we can be aware of certain nutrients. Uh, for example, vitamin B6 and glutathione, if somebody is uh, low or insufficient or deficient in those, that can have the effects that we talked about earlier. Consumption of certain supplements, like for example, collagen and creatine, which we talked about, um, if the body isn't utilizing those for the purpose that the supplements were intended for, like if we consume more than what the body needs, then we tend to see the formation of more oxalic acid. How can we minimize oxalate absorption and oxalic acid production? Number one, uh, balance the microbiome. Make sure that we have good amounts of oxalobacter formigenes, which consumes oxalate. Oxalate is its favorite food. So one of the ways that we can do that is by having foods in our diet that actually have oxalate in them. So we can feed and maintain oxalobacter formigenes in our microbiome. Also, make sure that we're in good calcium status. Lots of plant foods can provide calcium for us. And one of the ways that you can see that for yourself is to uh, go over to um, Chronometer, or one of the other um, online nutrient analysis programs and see what your daily diet looks like in terms of calcium. And then in addition to that, uh, pay attention to vitamin B6 and glutathione in your diet. You can take a look for yourself to see where your diet is. I just mentioned Chronometer, other nutrient analysis software can help you determine that as well in terms of vitamin B6, and then also be aware of glutathione sources, like the ones that I mentioned earlier. And also minimize supplements that lead to the production of more oxalate, such as collagen and creatine. Like I said earlier, if your body isn't using them for the purpose intended because your body already has plenty of those things, then they will be converted into oxalate. These are all important considerations. 
and to drive home Dr. Karen's summary just a bit more in the context of the oxalate paradox, the title of this webinar, the paradox is that oxalic acid production in the body is inevitable, which number one, that's pretty monumental. And the dietary profile of people who want to avoid dietary oxalate typically drive the pathways that cause increased internal production of oxalic acid more than those who eat plant-based diets that include oxalate in them. In other words, people are causing the issue that they're trying to avoid and don't even know that it's happening within their own bodies. Quick review and summary. Normal amino acid metabolism drives this pathway that produces oxalic acid. All else being equal, the more excess protein you are consuming, which tends to occur on animal-based diets, the more this pathway gets driven and the more oxalic acid is produced. Additionally, collagen is the major connective tissue in our bodies, just like Dr. Karen said, there's a little bit of turnover driving this pathway producing oxalic acid. But if some of your protein is from animals, collagen is the major connective tissue in animal products as well, or for animals, just like it is for us, you drive this pathway even more. On top of that, if you take collagen protein, which is very popular these days, you drive this pathway even more creating more oxalic acid within the body that you are trying to avoid. Additionally, creatine is a byproduct of muscle breakdown. So we've got a little bit leading to this, but if you take a creatine supplement, you drive this even more, producing more oxalic acid in your body. And finally, Free radical production leads to this pathway. So the more free radicals you have in your body, the more oxalic acid you are producing, all else being equal. And plant foods, which are often avoided because they contain oxalate, are often extraordinary sources of antioxidants, which counteract free radicals. And the fewer free radicals you have, the less you drive this pathway. So you're missing out on that also by avoiding plants. Dr. Karen made it very clear that there's plenty of glutathione in plant foods, but that's sometimes misconstrued out there in the media. And by the way, glutathione is an antioxidant enzyme that our body produces uh, on its own. Dr. Karen also made it very clear that there's plenty of vitamin B6 in plant foods. And by the way, the major source of free radicals also comes from the body. And plant foods, and this is a whole other story, actually help keep our internal production of free radicals the lowest while also supplying, supplying the greatest amount of antioxidants, which further keep free radical levels down in the body. Additionally, some oxalate in your diet actually helps increase microbiome diversity by feeding the probiotic bacteria known as oxalobacter formigenes, and that's very beneficial. And then many plant foods are excellent sources of calcium, especially from green leafy vegetables that contain Oxalate. So Dr. Karen mentioned that when you get your calcium levels at 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams per day, that can help minimize oxalate absorption in the intestines. Now, if you still want to choose lower oxalate high calcium foods like kale and lettuce instead of the higher oxalate high calcium foods like spinach and Swiss chard, that's fine with us. But to avoid even the low oxalate foods means that you miss out on some additional microbiome diversity, additional sources of calcium, as well as fiber, vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, antioxidants, and so much other goodness in those plant foods. So, so that whole calcium oxalate absorption is almost a, another little mini paradox within the bigger paradox. 
And, you know, it reminds us that there are several other comparable situations within nutrition where a little bit of information taken out of context can lead to actions that are not in the best interest of people's health and can often do just the opposite of what they are intending. We cover several of these in our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course. They aren't well known about in the general health community uh, and by influencers on social media, and they're even not very well known about in the plant-based doctor communities. We believe very firmly in nutrition as well as pretty much any aspect in life that when you have thorough, complete, useful information that you can make much better decisions and can expect better outcomes compared to if you have incomplete, taken out of context, not as useful information that will lead to actions that lead to poorer outcomes. When people are just going for hits and clicks and likes and they don't have their nose and eyes in the research like we do to really try to figure these things out, you get a much different perspective and it's a totally different profile. If what you've heard here in this webinar makes sense to you and you'd like to consider taking a year-long deep dive into understanding whole food plant-based nutrition with an emphasis on fresh fruits and vegetables to cut through the confusion and be very well informed and be able to realize so much more of your full health potential from a dietary perspective, then please stay tuned to hear about our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition Curriculum. In today's presentation, we cover just a small fraction, a small sampling of what we have to offer. For those of you who would like to continue your education with us, please consider joining us for our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition 12-month online and interactive course. Our next course begins at the end of August. As you can see here, we recommend about four hours per week to be able to get the most value from the course. I'll first share some of the topics that we cover in this course so you know what to expect, followed by how the course material is delivered, interspersed with some comments from previous students about their experience in mastering raw food nutrition. So we cover a huge array of topics in the course. Pretty much everything that's really important to know about whole food plant-based nutrition from a raw fruit and vegetable based perspective that you can use to make sense out of all the information out there and really implement things to the fullest benefit and to your, the fullest extent possible. I've got a second slide of screens here with just they're coming out about a second at a time. And Dr. Karen and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what's most important and how do we deliver this information in a way that saves you time so you don't have to spend hundreds of hours out there figuring it all out. Each topic is important and we get succinct and we cover just the core but in some depth and detail and then we see how everything all fits together. So here come some more topics as well. In the past, I've explained each of these and it takes seven or eight or nine minutes uh, to go through all of this, but I'm gonna let you just see the thumbnails that are coming out. And then in the next few screens after this, we've got the course divided into roughly four segments because there's four notebooks that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And these are the topics here that we cover in notebook number one. So for those of you watching the recording here, I'll let you hit pause so you can take a look at those topics, but for the rest of you, I will keep things moving. Here's what we cover in notebook number two. Again, a great time to hit pause and read this over. Here's what we cover in notebook number three. And here's what we cover in notebook number four. That all adds up to about 100 hours of pre-recorded video content similar to what you're seeing here with a PowerPoint presentation and either Dr. Karen or myself giving that presentation, we each cover about 50% of the course content. When we get to notebook four, you can see that some of these things have to do with the 20% or so of our students who wish to go out and educate other people. 
So some of this stuff is not relevant for everyone, building an audience, connecting with your audience, uh, basics of internet marketing. But for those of you who do want to go teach others, all of this information is incredibly valuable. Once again, for those of you not wanting to teach other people, just wanting to know this information for yourself, for your friends, for your family, to cut through the confusion, uh, to be as healthy as possible, a lot of the information here summarizes and solidifies what we had in the course up until that point. So for example, one of our students in last year's class, Billy, who is a nurse practitioner, I'm gonna to skip to the end here, says, I enjoyed the questions about raw food presentations delivered at the end. They really helped solidify knowledge. So she was talking about this section here. The rest of her testimonial says, I have really appreciated this course. Dr. Rick and Dr. Karen have skillfully amassed a huge database of nutrition information that they present here. They are completely non-judgmental. They are very well organized. They are super nice people. If you're looking for excellent information on good nutrition, you can't go wrong by attending this course. She also said, I really enjoyed the discussions on fatty acids and calorie density and fasting. Before I go on to how the course is delivered, let's take a look at another couple of testimonials. Here is a naturopathic practitioner named Amanda from France who said via email, and then I use this with her permission, she said, I take advantage of this email to tell you again how much I appreciate this curriculum. So valuable information and discussions. It is a great pleasure to attend it, and I can imagine the amount of research and work that you have done both to provide us with this quality training. We're always so honored when people like Amanda, who are already well-educated about nutrition, join us to bring their knowledge base up a few levels and be more effective to those who they influence, in the case of Amanda, her patients. Uh, we had another student from France who says, uh, in the same class, who says, Hi, my name is Nadej and I come from France. I chose to follow this course because I was following a raw food diet, but were a bit lost amongst all the discordant voices um, I heard about on social media. We all know how that goes. Furthermore, in my remissions from Crohn's disease, and yes, a raw foodist in remissions from Crohn's disease, that's a whole other topic, mastering my diet is really important for my health. The Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course delivered a very precise and scientifically proven way to have a raw food diet able to optimize health. They really helped me design my own diet and now on Chronometer, the app she uses to track her nutrients that we recommend, all the lights are green. I couldn't have chosen a more complete curriculum. The conferences each week were so helpful. I got all my questions answered and also learned a lot from the questions of my fellow students. Meeting people from all around the world every week and benefiting from all the wisdom and knowledge of Karen and Rick was priceless. I want to also share that the course really helped me design a better diet for my husband and kids, which are plant-based but not raw foodists. The course is really complete and help better understand nutrition as a whole, not only raw food nutrition, even if it's the main subject, we teach from a whole food plant-based perspective with an emphasis on raw fruits and vegetables. Nadej goes on to say, I even get to help omnivorous people around me getting toward a more plant-forward diet thanks to what I learned this year. Thank you so much, Karen and Rick. You changed my life for the better. We're always so honored to hear student experiences like that. We get a whole bunch of them every year. So how do we deliver the course content in order to create those type of experiences for our students? So first of all, there are two hours worth of professional quality videos released each week. Those are actually released on Wednesdays. You can watch those on your own schedule. Um, they remain there for the entire rest of the course. As long as you have internet access and a, a suitable device, you can access those videos. Like I mentioned earlier, it's two hours worth of an extremely efficient use of your time. All the gibberish is gone, and it really gets down to understanding the topics 
very thoroughly. For those who just want to listen and not watch the videos, this isn't so much of a, a concern these days, but in years past it was. You want to save some mobile data, for example, we have the audio-only version of the videos available as well. We physically mail you four comprehensive notebooks. It's about 900 pages worth of notes. We've got all the scientific references that we use to put the course together in the back, and they are designed to complement the educational videos. So if you have your notebooks open while you're watching the videos, 90% of the graphs and the information in bullet points is in the notebook. So you can not have to distract yourself trying to write everything down that you see in here. It's in the, most of it's in the notebooks. You may still want to take a few extra notes. That way you can really focus on what you're seeing and hearing and let the information sink in. These notebooks also provide lifetime reference material and many of our past students have shared with us that they're so happy they have these to just pull off their shelf and look at um, to look things up in the future. So there we go, uh, four of the notebooks. We mail those all over the world. Here's a couple of examples of what the notes look like. They don't say proof uh, in the real notebooks, but charts, graphs, um, we, we show how everything works. It, it's very solid reference material that helps enhance the learning experience in the course. Once you go through the two hours of educational videos each week, there is an optional quiz that you can access from the course outline, five question, multiple choice, and you pick the right answer. Uh, it tells you if it was right or if it was wrong. And then for each question, it gives you an explanation of why the right answer was right and why the other choices was wrong to help enhance the learning experience. So then after the videos are released on Wednesday, you go through your notebooks, you take the quiz. The following Tuesday, we have a live conference to cover that week and or the recent course material. So we, we were there every Tuesday except the last Tuesday of the month. We're there at two different times. So we're here in California on Pacific time. Conference number one is at 10 a.m. That's 1 p.m. Eastern time, 7 p.m. Central European time. Conference number two is 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 Eastern. So in the evening for people in North America, not a good time if you're in Central, if you're anywhere in Europe or in Israel, you're asleep then. That's why conference number one is best for students in those regions. Conference number two is also Friday morning or potentially early afternoon in places like Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, we chose those times to strategically hopefully cover most people in most regions. And if you can make one of those conferences live, that's fantastic. But even if you can't, you can submit questions in advance and then during the conferences, Dr. Karen or I answer the questions in advance as well as the live questions, and then we audio record each of those conferences. So you might not act, uh, interact with us in real time, but you can still submit your questions and then listen to the answers as well as the answers of questions from your fellow students and some of the discussion that ensues on the recordings all at your own schedule. So our students, so many of them just love those conferences. We also have a, a format within our course delivery system where students can make posts and introduce themselves and get to know each other and share some experiences. We also have another section where we will oftentimes post links to articles and additional information when good questions come up during the live conferences, uh, we'll add some extra information into our study group to help support answering those questions and making sure everyone understands the material. So to put that all into one slide here, two hours of professional videos per week with the audio only versions available as well, thoughtfully designed notebooks for each subject, weekly interactive optional quizzes, uh, near weekly live video conferences, and we have study and social groups in there as well. 
It's all designed to help everyone understand this material so they can utilize it most effectively in their lives. And there's the people on the bottom right jumping for joy. Now, as I mentioned, many of our students, 20% or so, want to teach other people, their coaches, their doctors, their nurses, their influencers. And for those people, as well as anyone else who would like to, we offer a certificate of accomplishment. About half of our students go through the process of earning a certificate. And in order to do that, there are three exams throughout the course, and we have our students submit a final project. For students who pass the exams and submit us a good quality final project, we print this out on really nice paper. It really says your name, not just your name here. And we sign it and we physically mail it to you and it is suitable for framing. So before we wrap up, I've just got a few more testimonials to take a look at. Uh, Lilla from Finland said, time and money well spent. Now I know more and can really answer to people who don't know. So many students tell us that it's easier to communicate with other people once they learn um, a lot of great information that makes sense to them and once they really understand it. Kimberly from Texas says, this class can save your life and make it so much better. She said, I loved the class and I'm so sad for it to end. Cynthia from California said, I enjoyed this class and learned a lot. You covered so many topics, including things I hadn't thought of before. I have a much clearer idea of how to design a raw and cooked diet for myself. Thank you. Kelsang from Spain said, what a year. It's amazing how much I've learned in this course, and it's been a lot of fun too. Thank you, Drs. Rick and Karen, for putting together this amazing online course and for all the energy and support that you have given along the way. Many thanks to all of my classmates too. All your questions and contributions have been wonderfully fruitful. In addition to all the goodies that I have gained from this course, also a love relationship came from this course. What else can I ask for? Now, it's really nice to go through a program with a bunch of other like-minded people who are willing to make the financial and the time investment in the course. Obviously, everyone's pretty enthused. Um, we can't guarantee that a love relationship is going to come out of it, uh, but this is really cool <laughs> when it happens. What we tend to hear consistently from our students year after year, class after class, including before we started teaching this Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course in the previous version called The Science of Raw Food Nutrition that we taught in person. We hear over and over again that students really appreciate the scientific accuracy and validity of what we talk about. They love that we go into some depth and detail and really answer some of the nitty gritty questions that are out there. As much as we're into science, we're known for making complex topics easy to understand. Some of our students are healthcare providers with science backgrounds, but most of our students are not. The healthcare providers like the accurate science. The other students like that it all makes sense, but they also have confidence that what they are learning is fully accurate. That helps to cut through the confusion so everything makes more sense. You don't have to spend tons of time being confused on social media and everything fits together into a cohesive whole. What we hear about ourselves personally as instructors in the course is that we are enthused and that we love answering questions. We have an encouraging and supportive attitude. We are also very rational and realistic, not extreme. We don't subscribe to or promote any dogma, our own or anyone else's. We truly want people to succeed over the long term. And as Billy said, and of other people have said, we're very nice people. What people get, what our students get from the course is the number one, they enjoy the learning process, like Kelsang said and many others, that it was fun. Most people find they make major improvements to their diets. It's an educational-based course, not a rah-rah motivation course, but it's very hard to not be really inspired 
by week after week learning about the benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables and other whole natural plant foods. So we love seeing that. Because students are so well educated, they're much more likely to keep things up over the long term. They feel so much more confident about all of this than they did before, and they find it easier to speak to others about how to eat. They can answer questions better, uh, and they can speak with greater authority, and then they also have a greater ability to distinguish nutritional reality from nonsense. Let me share just a couple of other things before we go. If you go to our website, rawfoodeducation.com, and you click on the testimonials page. You will see several testimonials from each class that we've had. We've had eight Mastering Raw Food Nutrition courses now. Um, one thing I wanted to share is that sometimes we have influencers and, and raw food celebrities, so to speak, join us. Uh, we had Lissa Maris of Raw Food Romance join us for our last year's class, as well as her husband, Nate. Uh, she absolutely loved the class and wrote us, I think she set a record uh, for the longest testimonial, so I'm going to save time now, but please read that over, especially if you're a fan of Lissa. And from our 2019-2020 class, I recently found an email that I hadn't put in here before, but this is from a student that says, I just want you to know that I am enjoying the class and am so thankful to be learning all of this valuable information. I am much better equipped to decide whether the nutritional information I come across in my daily life is valid or not. It is so comforting to know that my foundation of knowledge in nutrition is based on facts and your years of experience. I am feeling more confident in my ability to discuss my food choices and also to disagree with those who are peddling nonsense. I am also taking what I am learning and applying it to my own life. I am eating much less cooked food than when I started in the class and recently have adopted a lower fat diet after a coming to Jesus moment on chronometer. It has been so much easier to apply changes when I know exactly why I am doing them and what the benefits are going to be even before I do them. Thanks again for all you do and stay healthy. So we just love getting those testimonials every year from our students. And then one really final point. Many, most of you are probably watching this recording of this webinar on the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition tab of our website, rawfoodeducation.com. Some of you are here watching the live presentation. In that case, you got an email with a link to speak to us about the course if everything you've heard sounds good and makes a lot of sense to you. If you're here watching the recording and you would like to speak with us, if you just scroll down to the very bottom of that page, here is a link right there. And if you scroll up a little ways, but still relatively near the bottom of the page, there is another link to speak to us here. For those of you who are considering joining us, please sign up for a time to speak with us and uh, we'll help determine if the course is a really good fit for you or if it's not. Thank you so much for your time and attention.